Shalom, beloved. Welcome to the Mighty Hand of God Ministries. I'm Scott Moore, and we are going to be discussing the measure for the treasure. Amen. That's the title of this program is The Measure for the Treasure. See, God has put within us, us earthen vessels, a treasure. And with that treasure comes a measure, a measure of faith. Amen. That will allow us to, to unveil, if you will, to get to that desired place where God can unveil our treasure upon the world and he will receive glory for that. Let's pray. Father, in the presence of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, we ask that your kingdom and your power and your glory and your honor and your wisdom and your riches and your blessing would descend and rest upon every household, upon every person, and upon every family that is viewing this broadcast, that, that your kingdom would come to them in the fullness of its manifestation, Father, that your will can be done in the lives of everyone that you have called according to your purpose for their lives. And Father, I ask that you would stretch out your hand to heal, to do miracle signs and wonders, as the angels from your presence would ascend and descend upon these households and upon these people and ministering to those needs. Father, I see needs that need to be met. Someone has a need. It looks like there's land or a house or or garage, or uh, something to do with um, land and property. They, there's some needs that they cannot see the the meeting of them. I pray, Father, even right now, that you would meet those needs. It looks as if it's a stone or a brick house. It's a brick house like that, a light brownish, reddish kind of brick house. And I can see like the walkway of it, and there's a need pertaining to that house. Receive it in the presence of Yeshua. Amen. Someone's back on the right side. Um, you're feeling a cooling sensation because God is ministering to that need. Someone has a headache over their right eye, over the, the forehead, over the right eye. Receive your healing in the presence of Yeshua. Someone's right knee. There's some uh, inflammation, some irritation. It feels like a type of uh, tendinitis of some sort. Receive your healing. In the presence of Yeshua, it's, uh, it's on the knee toward the right uh, inside of the right knee. But it's, um, it's on the front of the knee, but it's toward the, the inner. So it's toward the left side of the right knee. Receive that healing in the presence of Yeshua. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for that, that oil of gladness. I thank you for your anointing, for your presence descending and resting upon the household. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's start with this, this treasure. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. God has put a treasure within us. Amen. Everyone who is called according to his purpose is a treasure that is hidden Amen. Chapter 4, verse 7 is the portion that I want to bring out, but I'm going to start at verse 1. God has shown us such mercy that we do not lose courage as we do the work he has given us. Remember, God has a measure of faith for the treasure. So it says that God has shown us such mercy. Amen. This mercy has to do with faith. Amen. It has to do with, with uh, grace. It has to do with us trusting in him. And it has to do with his, his presence, his ability uh, upon our lives. His anointing and appointing upon our lives. He has shown us such mercy that we do not lose courage. 
Amen. He's shown us such mercy that we don't lose courage. That courage is connected to the faith and the trust. Amen. It's, it's all connected, but it's particularly the faith and the trust that causes you to not to lose courage. Right? It's the mercy, the grace, the, the gifting, his presence, his, his ability, his infusing us, if you will, with his presence that is connected to the mercy. The, the word mercy means for God to bow down or to bend his knee and to have pity on us. Amen? But the courage part has to do with trust. It has to do with trusting in that mercy. Amen? If God is bending down to give us something and we are fearful, then we're not going to receive it. We're going to run the other direction. Amen? So there has to be a trusting. A fear is the, the opposite of trust. That's why the scripture says, do not fear. So often it says, do not fear and don't doubt. Amen? Because it works against your faith. Amen? He says that we do not lose courage as, as we do the work he has given us. Now, this treasure that God has put in us is connected to the work that he has given us. Everybody's work's not the same. Everybody's not going to be the boss or the owner of, a, let's say, a plant shop or a farmer. Everybody's not going to be the, the boss of the hospital or the boss of the flower shop. Uh, everybody's not going to be in that position. Some of us are going to be the worker bee, if you will. We're going to be on the servant end of these things where our hands are the hands that, that touch people's lives. Bosses, their hands don't generally touch the people's lives. Amen. There are certain people that they um, administer and then they, they have, let's say they're over the thousands and then they have those up under them that are over hundreds. And then those under them are over 50s, and then those under them are over, say, thousands. And those are the ones that are touching people's lives. Amen. But everybody is not on the same level, if you will. And I use that word carefully because I don't want you to think that any are more important. It's not that there's more important than the other, right? My finger is no less important than the arm. But yet, it's on a different level. If I hold it downward, you'll see that my arm is on a higher level than my hand. Now, if I put my hand above my head, obviously the hand is on a higher level. But yet, they're same importance. Amen. And I need them all. Amen. It says, Indeed, we refuse to make use of shameful, underhanded methods employing deception or distorting God's message. On the contrary, by making very clear what the truth is, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So if indeed our good news is veiled, it is veiled only to those in the process of being lost. Wow. Only the ones who this good news that we speak of, that Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, King of heaven and earth, all authority in heaven and earth being given unto him, his blood being poured out, for our curse, for our sin, for our death, so that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That good news is only, is only veiled to those in the process of being lost. In other words, when you're in a process of being found, being the opposite of lost, the process of turning your heart to the Lord the veil is removed. Hallelujah. And then you're able to see the Lord face to face. And not only that, but you're able to be changed into the image of the glory of the Father. Amen. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's prior, uh, just before that. Matter of fact, why don't, why don't we just skip up a few verses and read that. Let's uh, read verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 16. It says, But says the Torah, whenever someone turns to Yahweh, the veil is taken away. Now Yahweh in this text means the spirit and where the spirit of Yahweh is, there is freedom. So all of us with faces unveiled see as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and we are being changed into his very image from one degree of glory to the next by Yahweh the spirit. And so when that veil is removed, we're actually able to see the face of the Lord. And when we see his face, there's a transformation. That's why fathers are so important to sons. Mothers are so important to uh, girls, daughters. It's because when you see the face, 
Amen. There's a change that happens. You see who it is that you are and who you are to become. And there's a change that happens when you see the Father God face to face. Something about you changes. You begin to put away the childish things. Amen. Uh, let's go to chapter 4, verse 4. It says, They do not come to trust because the God of the Olam Haze, this present world arrangement, this cosmos, Satan, has blinded their minds in order to prevent them from seeing the light shining from the good news about the glory of the Messiah, who is the image of God. For what we are proclaiming is not ourselves, but the Messiah Yeshua as Lord, with ourselves as slaves for you because of Yeshua. Someone has a headache, and it's around the whole rim. If you could imagine this hat, wherever this hat is connecting to, there's a headache, there's some pressure. Receive your healing in the presence of Yeshua. Amen. Four, verse six. For it is the God who once said, it is the God who once said, let light shine out of darkness, who has made his light shine in our hearts. The light of the knowledge of God's glory shining in the face of the Messiah Yeshua. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it will be evident that such overwhelming power comes from God and not from us. We have a treasure, amen, in clay jars, earthen vessels. And in this thing there is, it says that, that it will be evident that such overwhelming power. So connected to this treasure, there's some power, amen. I'm talking about the treasure that God is putting you. There is an overwhelming power. We wonder how a kid who's been abandoned by their parents can grow up and be a superstar, amen, whether it be athletics or being a doctor or astronaut or whatever, but they can be born in a situation where everything is set against them, and yet it doesn't stop them from becoming an international mogul. And it's the power that's in that treasure. There's an overwhelming power, and it comes from God, and it's not from us. So we have all kinds of troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, yet not in despair. Persecuted, yet not abandoned. Knocked down, yet not destroyed. We're always carrying our bodies, the dying of Yeshua, so that the life of Yeshua may be manifested in our bodies too. For we who are alive are always being handed over to death for Yeshua's sake, so that Yeshua's life also might be manifested in our mortal bodies. Thus, death is at work in us but life in you. Amen. So he's talking about from a position of a governor, right? I'm a p apostle. I'm Apostle Scott Moore, Apostle Dr. Scott T. Moore, right? From the position of the governor, I've had to suffer through some things. I've been perplexed. I've been, a, uh, what does it say, persecuted. I've been knocked down, right? I've had all kinds of troubles. Amen. For, not for my sake, but for yours, if I didn't go through, if I didn't go through all of the, the breaking and the, the knocking of down and the, the perplexing, um, if I didn't go through these things, then I would not be a witness of his power. If I didn't go through homelessness, then there wouldn't be a witness of the power that I could be ministering from within a home. Amen. If, if I didn't go through the homelessness, that part of the testimony is out of it. I'm just going from house to house, everything provided. And so lo and behold, here I am. But if there was something where I'm homeless, I'm without transportation, there is no reasonable way that I should have arrived to here. Now, we got to talk about the power that got me here. Amen? And there, I'm, what I'm telling you is that there is a measure of faith, of trust, with that treasure. 
And it's with that faith and trust that God is going to do what he said he's going to do, regardless of these um, being knocked down, regardless of the being, what else did it say, um, being persecuted, regardless of the, the, uh, the being perplexed and, and, and all kinds of troubles, regardless of that. Whatever life throws at you, and when I say life, I'm talking about the God of this world, this, uh, this Olam Haze, right? This present world. Whatever is throwing at you, the treasure that God has placed in you has an overwhelming power to where it overwhelms those situations. Hallelujah. God's power that is connected to the treasure in you is going to overwhelm. Every situation, whether it be sickness, someone has an uh, issue with their heart and chest that God is ministering to. Let the treasure, the power that is tied to that treasure in you, let it overwhelm that heart condition. Amen. Receive your healing in the presence of Yeshua. Amen. It's going to, oh, I love that. I love that no matter what it is that is trying to hold you back, that thing, that very thing, whether it be uh, debt, whether it be um, some physical oppression, mental oppression, emotional oppression, whatever the press is, that press is going to get overwhelmed, hallelujah, by the power that's connected to that treasure, amen. And we connect and tap into and embrace and cleave to that treasure and the power connected to that treasure by faith, by trust. And, and this is, what I'm talking about here is something that will literally pull you through your situations. And, and it's not you trying in your own strength. You're just holding on and, and believing and trusting that you, you have the strength to not let go. Amen. You're not running anything. You're just holding on and following this. It's as if your treasure is the horse. And you're just holding on to the reins and trying not to fall off this buggy. Or if it even if it doesn't have a buggy, you're just sitting on the horse and just holding on to the reins of this horse or the hair, the mane, whatever it is that you can grab onto and you're not letting go until this horse gets you to where the horse has the power to take you. Amen. There's no failure in this thing. It doesn't matter how many sidetracks that you come upon. It doesn't matter how many. The scripture says that one can put a thousand to flight. That means that in the enemy's mind, it's a fair fight for him to have a thousand coming at the one you. <laughs> that, that's how the enemy hates us so. Amen? And it doesn't matter that that thousand is coming at you. The power, the overwhelming power connected to that treasure that is in you is able to overwhelm those thousand. That is good news. That That's a hallelujah. I can see somebody ought to be just running around in your apartment right now and giving a shout to God because that is tremendous when you catch the revelation of that. When you catch the revelation that it doesn't even matter how distressed you think you are at the time, that God's treasure is still working. It doesn't matter if you thought you decided to give up. God's treasure is still working on our behalf. And if we just have the sense, the common walking around sense to, to hold on to that treasure, right? The Israel when they were in the uh, wilderness, the scripture says that when the glory cloud moved, they moved with it. And when it stayed, they stayed. If we just have common walking around sense to move when that glory cloud moved, or the horse, or whatever you want to call this power that's connected to this treasure that he gives us, then we're going to make it. And that's the good news. We're going to make it. You're going to make it. I'm going to make it. We're all going to get there because God is not weak. And God is not insufficient. There is no um, time when we tap into God's ATM and it comes back insufficient funds. There, there's, that's not going to be a case. There's never going to be that situation. There's always going to be a sufficiency of grace. Amen? Always. 
His grace is always going to be sufficient for us. Amen. That means that that treasure, that overwhelming power in that treasure is able to overtake. The scripture says wherever sin is abounding, amen, wherever any criminal offenses against us by the God of this world are abounding, God's grace much more abounds. That means that if, if the sin against you, the criminal offense, the unrighteous judgment that's coming against you, a son, a child of God, a daughter of God, if it's taking one step, then the grace is going to take at least two. Amen? If it's taking one step this way, the grace is able to back it up at least two steps. It's going to much more abound. And I'm just saying at least two, but it's probably more like one to a thousand. Amen? Because God is just, it says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against it. You can look at it as the enemy on the flood and God having a standard, which, which basically just means that that flood just makes God's standard rise higher and higher. So you're still above. Or you can see it as the enemy coming in and God being the flood. It doesn't matter because either way it goes, the people of God, the kingdom of God is overcoming and overtaking. Amen. Whew. Praise God. Okay, so we have this in us, right? This treasure, this treasure in earthen vessel. That earthen vessel, that clay pot is us. And that treasure is connected to something and it's called trust. It's called faith, but the translation or interpretation of faith is trust. So let's go now to Romans chapter... Chapter 12, verse 6. Romans, chapter 12, verse 6. Hallelujah. Romans, chapter 12, verse 6. I will start in verse 1. I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourselves as a sacrifice, living and set apart for God. This will please him. It is the logical temple worship for you. In other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the Olam Haze, this present world. Instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. Amen. So we got to know what God wants and then we got to agree with what he wants. Sometimes we know what God wants and we don't agree with it. And it doesn't serve us well. It, it is hard to kick against the goals as, as the Lord spoke to, um, to Saul who became the apostle Paul or Saul. He told him, uh, why are you persecuting me, Saul? And then he says, who are thou, Lord? And he said, it's me, Yeshua. He said, it's hard to kick against the gold. It's hard to kick against the pricks. Amen. You see something that, that God wants for your life and you don't agree with it. It's hard to kick against that. It's hard to go against that. I mean, everything in your life starts to fall apart and go contrary to you once God has shown you what he wants for your life. It's hard to be content and happy where you are. It's, it's just a hard thing. But when we can agree with it, when we can agree with it, it says right here that um, we'll, we can agree that what he wants is good and satisfying and able to succeed. And so now we come into a peace. Even when the world around us is falling apart, when it looks like um, we're going to get knocked down and not get back up, we still have a peace. Amen. Because we agree. That what God wants is good. And we know that it's God that's showing us what he wants. We know it. Amen. We know it because the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that this is it. He's shown us in vision. He's shown us in dreams. It's not just because a person has told us or someone who we have faith in has spoken it, but he's spoken it to us. And then they confirm it. And not just the one person that we know, people that we don't know. There were people telling me that I was going to be ministering to people, lots of people. Um, when I was feeling like I was at the lowest lows, I didn't even have a ride. I couldn't get myself even to the church house, the fellowship, 
um, on my own. I had to depend on someone else to get a ride. Um, and then it got to the point where not only did I not have a ride, but I didn't have a home. I didn't have a place to live. And during that time, there were people, strangers, people that I didn't know that didn't know me. They go to walk by me and they're just like, whoo, boy, there's an anointing on you and, and you're going to minister to all these people. And lo and behold, I couldn't see it from there. I agreed with it. I already knew it because God had spoken it to me, but I didn't know he was telling other people. Right? I just thought he was telling me. And so I'm just patiently waiting for that and, um, and holding on to that treasure um, wherever it's taken me, being obedient to him, which is my reasonable temple service, right? And uh, lo and behold, here we are. I'm in your living room or wherever it is that you're watching me. Nowadays, you can watch me on the phone, right? Um, you can just stream it through uh, Ustream and watch it over your phone wherever you are. But, um, but here we are, right? Me serving you with the good news of the kingdom of heaven and the sustenance of the kingdom of heaven. Not just words, but with power, authority, glory, honor, wisdom, blessing, and riches. The kingdom, amen? It's at hand. Receive it. I feel the Lord has broken up something. There was some congestion, something tight in a chest, and now there's a, a release. There's a... Um, a breath, if you will. It's like a cool, smoky, menthol type of, it's a breath in there. That God is releasing something. The light is breaking forth. Amen. The powers of this world are getting overwhelmed. Hallelujah. And you're coming out of that thing. Praise God. Amen. I didn't get the, the, the verse that I wanted yet. Okay, so verse 3. For I am telling every single one of you, through the grace that has been given to me, not to have exaggerated ideas about your own importance. Instead, develop a sober estimate of yourself based on the standard which God has given to each of you. Namely, trust is a standard. Wow. This is the complete Jewish Bible version that I'm reading from. Um, so it's the literal Hebrew translations of, um, or yes, the translation from literal Hebrew. Um, most Bibles, the, the New Testament is been translated um, from, uh, from the Greek. Amen. So you look in the Greek concordance if you want to find out what the words mean um, in the New Testament. The Old Testament is from the Hebrew. Well, these people that wrote in the New Testament are Hebrews. And so they had a Hebrew as well. Um, translation and and not only a translation but an interpretation meaning that there are certain ways that they talk and they mean certain things for example uh, there's a pastor um, Larry Huck who I was under his ministry for a while and uh, he used to give the example that if you're reading in a history book about um, a man riding on a hog down the street um, or on a hog well, if this person is from, say, Arkansas, they might be talking about a literal hog animal. But if the person is from St. Louis, so to speak, then that person is talking about a Harley Davidson motorcycle. And so the words, the hog word might be the same, but it's a totally different uh, meaning. I mean, riding on a pig is way different from riding on a Harley Davidson. Right? This is a way different experience. And so, this complete Jewish Bible is giving you um, an interpretation or an, an a feel from how the Hebrews would have used these words. And so, here it's saying that God is uh, given a standard. It says that instead, develop a sober estimate of yourself based on the standard which God has given to each of you, namely trust. So, now God is using the word standard as trust. And I just used... And scripture earlier where it says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against it. Look at that. The standard trust or faith. Faith is a standard that is used against the enemy. Now remember, the title of this message is that the God will give a measure of faith to every treasure. Or every treasure comes with a measure of faith. 
Amen. So there's a measure for the treasure. Whatever it is that God has put in you as a treasure, whatever that vision is for your life, right? That's the treasure. That's the, the spirit of God, um, his handprints, his, uh, what he put in the DNA for you to what you are to become. Right? The scripture says, now we are the sons of God, yet it does not appear what we shall be. <laughs> right? But right now we're sons, but it doesn't appear what we shall be. We don't know if we're going to be an apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, a teacher, a doctor. Right? We don't know. A lawyer. We don't know what it is that you're going to be. But the treasure does. Amen? That treasure that God puts in your heart. Amen? That treasure comes with a measure of faith, namely trust. It comes with a standard, amen, something that is able to overwhelm, amen, overwhelm the floods of the enemy or overwhelm with the flood, right? It's, it's either this standard is a flood that's able to overwhelm the enemy or this standard is able to overwhelm the enemy's flood. No matter how you look at it, either way that you want to interpret that, this standard is greater. Amen? It's greater. And I really don't care if it's a flood greater or a drop greater. As long as I win. Right? That's all I care about. As long as I win. Amen? And God has said that we win. And that's good news, that we win. Amen. That means that whatever it is that God has spoken and decided for your life, it shall come to pass. And even right now as I speak, the kingdom of heaven, the power of heaven, the glory, the honor, the wisdom, the blessing, and the riches of heaven are connecting to you and that treasure to get you there. It's a sealed, done deal. Amen. I like that. A seal done deal. I'm going to have to write that down. Okay, verse 4. For just as there are many parts that compose one body, but the parts don't all have the same function, so there are many of us. And in union with the Messiah, we comprise one body with each of us belonging to the others. But we have gifts that defer, and which are meant... To be used according to the grace that God, that, that has been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, use it to the extent of your trust. If it is serving, use it to serve. If you are a teacher, use your gift in teaching. If you are a counselor, use your gift to comfort and absorb. If you are someone who gives, do it simply and generously. If you are in a position of leadership, lead with diligence and zeal. If you are one who does acts of mercy, do them cheerfully. Don't let love be a mere hour show. Recoil from what is evil and cling what is good. Love each other devotedly and with brotherly love and set examples for each other in showing respect. Don't be lazy when hard work is needed, but serve the Lord with spiritual fervor. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in your troubles. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Share what you have with God's people and practice hospitality. Amen. Then it goes on to say, bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be sensitive to each other's needs. Don't think yourselves better than others, but make humble people your friends. Don't be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but try to do what everyone regards as good. If possible, and to the extent that it depends on you, live in peace with all people. Never seek revenge, my friends. Instead, leave that to God's anger. For in the Tanakh it is written, Yahweh says, Vengeance is my responsibility. I will repay. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap fiery coals of shame on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Amen. So all of that is, is tied into this trust. Amen. This trust, this faith that God has given us a measure of. Each of us. 
each of us a measure of. We don't have any cause or means of boasting here. It's this gift, this faith is a gift, is a gift from God, uh, lest any man can boast. Amen? And we've been given a measure of it. Hallelujah. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. And then we'll go to Hebrews chapter 11. So Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Okay. All right. Verse 17. So trust comes, faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through a word proclaimed about the Messiah. But I say, isn't it rather that they didn't hear? No, they did hear. Their voice has gone out throughout the whole world and the words to the ends of the earth. But I say, isn't it rather that Israel didn't understand? I will provoke you to jealousy over a non-nation, over a nation void of understanding. I will make you angry. Moreover, Yeshayahu, that's Isaiah, boldly says, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I became known to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I held out my hands to a people who kept disobeying and contradicting. Now, when he says to Israel, he's not talking about all of Israel. Amen. He's talking about those few that did not believe. And that had a purpose so that we can be engrafted in. Amen. So the point of this is to say that this faith, this trust that is given, this the measure that is given for the treasure comes from what is heard about the Messiah. When you hear about the Messiah's goal, his plan for your life, for this earth that we live in, for your generations, um, your family, your household, when you hear about that, that faith gets connected to that treasure. Amen? And not everybody's hearing the same thing. I might speak one thing and five different people hear something different. And they're saying I said it, but I really didn't say it. I said a particular thing and because of that thing there, God started speaking to their heart in regard to their treasure. And then they hear something. They hear something that I didn't say. It's connected to what I said, but it's not what I said. And so, so this faith, this trust that comes from hearing about the Messiah, when you hear that the Messiah has all authority in heaven and earth, right? When you hear that, now the Lord starts speaking to what he told you about such and such and, and this or that. And now that, that uh, treasure, which is when, when he's speaking, he's, he's depositing a treasure. Okay, when God is speaking to your heart, when he's giving you a vision, he just gave you a treasure. When he's giving you a word as to an assignment or an appointing, he's giving you a treasure. Amen. He's putting that treasure inside of you because now this treasure is, it, it has to spring forth. Amen. It has to grow like a tree. Amen. And then those branches are going to spread out and other people are going to be able to eat of that. They're going to be able to partake of these leaves that are healing for the nation. They're going to be able to partake of that fruit, which is going to be sustenance to their souls. Amen. So God speaks a treasure. And so when I speak a word about the Messiah, amen, now that word is able to connect. The scripture says that deep calls the deep at the noise of thy water spouse. So that word is able to speak to the deep. The treasure that has been planted deep in you. God does not plant in treasure, you know, in our skin. You know, because that's connected to census. That's too close to this world. Amen. He's not collect, connected or planting his treasure, say, in our, our mind, so to speak. Right? Because our mind is influenced by what we see. He's not planting it in our tongue, so to speak. Because our tongue is influenced by what we feel. And what we smell. He's planting this thing deep. He's not even putting it in our emotions. Because our emotions hear a big boom and it run. 
Amen. He's not putting it in our instincts. That's not where he plants his treasure. Now, our gifts manifest uh, easily in our, in our instincts. It manifests in our physical. Sometimes it manifests in our mental. But that's not where it's starting. God is planting these things deep in the heart. The scripture says that the word of God is sharp. That is, than any two-edged sword. It's quick. It's alive. It's powerful. And it's able to decide asunder spirit, soul, joint, and marrow. And able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. The heart is the deepest part of our being. It's the core of our being. It's that center. It's where everything generates from. Scripture says that we speak out of the abundance of our heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It doesn't matter how you're thinking up here in your mind or in your brain, so to speak, right? It's how you think in your heart. You can read all of the self-help books. You can hypnotize yourself and, and have your mantras and your moanings and your humming and, and all of these things. And that does not change who you are in your heart, right? Only the Word of God can change the heart. That's why this good news of the Messiah is so important because he is the God who sits on the throne of the heart. His mercy seat is in the heart. Amen. That's good news. God says, I'm going to create a new law, a new covenant. I'm going to write my word on your what? On your heart. And then he says, here, let's look at that. Let's go over to uh, Hebrews, right? The book of the Messianic Jews. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, I'll start at verse 5. Amen. It says, This is why on coming into the world, he says, It has not been your will to have an animal sacrifice and a meal offering. Rather, you have prepared for me a body. No, you have not been pleased with burnt offerings and sin offerings. There's such an energy with me writing this. It's like, a, like zzz, praise God. That's the spirit of God. That's the presence of God that you're sensing. That's the kingdom of heaven being at hand. There's an energy involved. Then I said, look, in the scroll of the book, it is written about me. I have come to do your will. And saying first, you neither willed nor were pleased with animal sacrifices, meal offerings, burnt offerings, and sin offerings, things which are offered in accordance with the Torah. And then, look, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first system in order to set up the second. It is in connection with this will that we have been separated for God and made holy once for all through the offering of Yeshua, the Messiah's blood. Now, now, a lot of us, right, and me included, have been taught that this right here is in reference of doing away with the law. Doing away as if the law was bad, right? The scripture says that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. It's not the curse of the law as if the whole law is cursed. No, it's the curse of the law, meaning there's a portion of the law that has a curse connected to it. You can read about it in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. You can see it really clearly. It says that if you do my covenant, do my law, all these blessings shall come upon you. And if you don't do my law, all of these curses will come upon you. And so there is a curse of the law, but that's only a portion of the law. There's a blessing of the law. We don't want to be redeemed and delivered from the blessing of the law. Every blessing in this book is based on the law. We want the blessing. Amen. We want that blessing. We say, Lord, bless you. God bless you. Because we want to be a blessing and we want that blessing. Amen. So this is not doing away with the law. This is doing away with the curse of the law. And there's a, there's a system as to how the Lord does away with the curse of the law. And I'm going to read on. It says, now, verse 11. Every Kohen stands every day doing his service. Kohen is priest. Um, offering over and over the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this one, after he had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, sat down at the right hand of God from then on to wait until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. 
For by a single offering he is brought to the gold for all time those who are being set apart for God and made holy. The goal of taking away the sin or the curse of the law. Right? He dealt with sin. Sin was connected to the curse of the law. Right? The curse of the law. Not the whole law being cursed, but the cursed portion of the law is what he dealt with, and that was his goal. And the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, too, bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant which I will make with them after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my Torah, my law, right? So, right here, this is God saying, I will put my law on their hearts and write it on their minds. Now, why would God write a curse on our hearts and on our minds as a new covenant, right? That makes no sense. He would not do that. No, he's writing his law on our hearts and our minds, but it's the blessing part of the law. The curse part of the law has been dealt with. It's dealt with in the blood of Yeshua. Amen. It's there, therefore, there is nothing now that can separate us from us from his love. We have to repent. We have to turn because without repentance, there is no forgiveness, right? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without repentance, there's no forgiveness. Amen? So we have to repent. We have to turn our heart. We have to turn from doing the sin, doing what brings the curse of the law. God is not just saying, okay, the curse of the law does not exist anymore forever because of what Yeshua did. That's nonsense because our actions bring about reactions equal and opposite, right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And so if I do a thing that is sin, it's going to reciprocate a thing that is curse. If I do a thing that is obedience, it's going to reciprocate a thing that is blessed. Amen? God is writing on our hearts and on our minds His law, His, His pathway to blessings on the deepest, most inner part of our being so that we can be fueled and that can override our mind, will, emotions, and our instincts. Amen? Our physical. And, and that is how it is that God is able to, to do away with the curse of the law and able to do away with sin and able to bring us into a blessing. Amen. That is the redemption process. That is the good news. Amen. That is the manifestation of the blessing unto us. That process. It says, then he asks, and their sins and their wickedness I will remember no more. So how is it that he, what, is he just selective memory? No, it's because you're not doing it. Because you're not living that way anymore. Now I don't remember it no more. Because you're walking in a pathway to blessing, I don't remember that you're walking on a, the road of degradation, as my uh, great-grandfather would say, right? I don't remember that anymore because you're not over there anymore, right? You're over here now, so I don't remember that. You know, you can't keep connecting me to a house that I grew up in if I'm not living there anymore, right? This is where I live now. So you got to come to this address to talk to me, right? You can't go to the place I used to live because I'm not there anymore. I'm over here. So when you come over here, we can talk together over here because this is where I am. And God is saying that I don't remember that anymore because you have turned, because you are now walking in my blessing, then my curse cannot connect to you. There is a hedge of protection that is built around you now because you're walking in my blessing. And the curse cannot get to you now. Amen. Praise God. Okay, now let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We're not going to read the whole of the matter, right? But we're talking about this trust, this faith. And, and it seems like you can't really talk about it unless we go here first. And so we're just going to speak a little bit about it and then I want to talk a little bit about the life of David and we're going to look a little bit into that so we can bring all this together about the member that there is a measure of faith for the treasure that every treasure comes with a measure of faith amen Hebrews 1 verse 11 
or chapter 11, verse 1 says, Trusting faith is being confident in what we hope for, convinced about things we do not see. Amen. Trusting is being confident in what we hope for and convinced about things we do not see. Now, let's jump over to 1 Samuel right quick with that in mind. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. 1 Samuel. Okay, here we go. Slightly different arrangement in this complete Jewish Bible and sometimes I uh, I tend to get caught up in the old arrangement the books are not all in the same order okay chapter 16 verse 13 okay I will read from I'll read from verse 11. It says, Are all your sons here? Shemuel, Samuel, asked Yeshai, Jesse. He replied, There is still the youngest. He's out there tending the sheep. Shemuel said to Yeshai, Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him back because we won't sit down to eat until he gets here. He sent and brought him in with ruddy cheeks, red hair, bright eyes. He was a good-looking fellow. Yahweh says, stand up and anoint him. He's the one. Shemuel took the horn of oil and anointed him there in his brother's presence. From that day on, the spirit of Yahweh would fall upon David with power. So Shemuel set out and went to Ramah. Now, Um, poured on him and it was because the people selected him as a king head and shoulders above everybody else he's tall and um, they wanted a king like all the other nations prior to this there was a prophet Moses you had Joshua Samuel you had um, Samson you had judges they didn't have a king they had judges who walked in the spirit of God but they wanted a king like every other nation so Saul did not do what God asked him to do and because of that, his kingdom was torn from him. And God had already selected another who was after his heart. And this right here is response because Samuel, Samuel, if you read about it, he was grieving over the fact that God rejected Israel because he rejected their king. And God is saying, don't, don't be grieving over this. I've already found someone after my own heart. And he's speaking of David. And then he sent him to Jesse's house to anoint David as king. And it says that the power, um, it says that the spirit of Yahweh would fall upon David with power. Amen. When God speaks a word, when he shows you a vision, when he plants that treasure, that treasure comes with power. Amen. It comes with power to overwhelm every situation that will come against you. And now let's look over here at chapter 17. Well, around verse 26. Uh, all right, verse 26. Well, let's look at verse, uh, verse 20, 
22. It says, David left his equipment in charge of the equipment guard, ran to the troops, went to his brothers, and asked if they were well. As he was talking with them, there came the champion, the Philisti, the Philistine from Gat, named Goliath, or Goliath. Uh, Goliath is how we pronounce it, uh, Americans. From the ranks of the Philistim, the Philistines, saying the same words as before, and David heard them. When the soldiers from Israel saw, they saw the man, they all ran away from him, terrified. They saw the champion. This guy was huge, said to be some nine plus feet tall, weighing some 500 pounds, just huge champion of a soldier. The soldiers from Israel said to each other, you saw that man who just came up. He has come to challenge Israel. To whoever kills him, the king will give a rich reward. He'll also give him his daughter. And he'll give him his daughter and exempt his father's family from all service and taxes in Israel. Wow. You imagine that? You do a thing for the president and all your taxes from your family are done with forever. No more taxes. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. It says, David said to the man standing with him, What reward will be given to the man who kills this kills this Philistine and, re and removes this disgrace from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway that he challenges the armies of the living God? The people answered with what they had been saying, adding, that's what will be done for the man who kills him. Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when David spoke to the man and, made it, and it made Eliab angry at him. He asked, why did you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You just came down to watch the fight. And David said, what have I done now? I only asked a question. He turned away from him and someone else, um, to someone else and asked the same question. And the people gave him the same answer. Now, I don't have time to read the whole of the matter, but you can read it. Of this account so basically David right who has this treasure that was planted in his heart right connected to the the oil that was poured over his head the horn of oil that he is to be the anointed king when they would call address Yeshua they would say Yeshua thou son of David have mercy on me right Jesus thou son of David have mercy on me they're connecting themselves to this David because his father's name was Joseph as far as they were all concerned, right? Joseph and Mary. And so this is the David. And David was promised that somebody would sit on his throne forever. Amen. Pointing to Yeshua, the Messiah. And so the scripture says that this anointing, the spirit of Yahweh came upon David with power. Amen. It fell upon this power of God will fall upon him. And it's David's trust. And that power and that anointing that makes him say this thing about who is this uncircumcised Philistine. There's no circumcision. There is no faith, no trust with God because the mark of faith in the body, the mark of trust of the covenant was the circumcision. This, this Philistine is not circumcised. And so he's not a part of God's camp. And he's threatening us who are the, the armies of the living God. He ser he's serving a dead God, a false God, and we serve the living God. Who is this guy to do this? Not like what's his name, but how dare he? Because his trust, his faith is in that treasure that God put in him. Amen. God being the living God, the living God who manifested himself to David in power. Amen. And the, the measure of the trust that came with that treasure it's obviously greater than the rest of them because none of us can see it. They're all running from them. And David is like a young boy compared to them. And he's not running. He's, he's ready to engage. And if you read on, he talks about how he killed a lion with his bare hands and how he took a bear and slapped him before he killed him. Hey Amen. He's like, if I can do that to the lion and the bear, who is this uncircumcised Philistines? I'm going to cut his head off and feed it to the birds. Amen. And so, or dogs, one of the two, I might be exaggerating a little bit, all right? But read the account and you will find out the power, the overwhelming power 
that is connected to that treasure, and it is the measure of faith. Amen. That's why when we see people going through things, we might say or think to ourselves, man, I could never do that. But in their mind, they're just doing what they had to do. They're just doing what came natural. We see a man run into a fire to save somebody and everybody else running out of the fire. We say, oh, you're a hero. How could you do that? And they're just saying, I just did what came to my mind. Right? Why? Because there's a measure of faith that is connected to the treasure. You cannot operate on somebody else's measure of faith. Amen? You can't look to the person to your left and the person to your right and say, all right, well, you believe that, you believe that, so that's what I believe and I'm going to do this. No. you got to operate to your measure. Amen? According to your treasure. I was fifth in the world as a tumbler. I knew a lot of people who who looked like they had more talent than me and, and sh displayed more strength and more physical ability, more courage, and yet I was fifth in the world. And they fell off somewhere along the way. And many times they would tell me, well, you can't be uh, best in the world. You can't be world rank. Who are you? Who are you? And all I had was the measure that was connected to my treasure that allowed me to get there. Amen. So be encouraged, beloved. Be encouraged that God... Whatever that treasure is that he's spoken to you, it is not uh, conditioned to your circumstances. It is not conditioned to your finances. It's not conditioned to who the people are in your life right now. It's only conditioned to that measure of faith, of trust in Yahweh, God, the Lord, of the Father of our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jehovah, right, the living God, the God of heaven and earth, amen, the king of the universe, is only connected into him, amen, Excuse me. and he will arrange people, he will set up circumstances in your life to make that treasure unveil itself, amen, and then we can all rejoice with you, amen, and celebrate that treasure in you, amen. And its fullness because it's already been prepared there is a there is a harvest there is a reward that has already been prepared and it's your treasure right that it is um, connected to and it is your faith your trust in Yeshua the Messiah in his covenant that is going to connect you to the treasure the overwhelming power that's gonna bring you there to that place amen Hallelujah. I'm trusting that this has been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing to me. Uh, may that Menuha rest that you feel. May that presence of the kingdom of heaven. May it rest upon you and your house. Amen. And now for the blessing. Yahweh will kneel before you presenting gifts and guard you with a hedge of protection. Yahweh will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you bringing order and he will beautify you. Yahweh will lift up the wholeness of his being towards you and look upon you and he will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. And in this way you shall put my name upon the sons and daughters of Israel and I will bless them, saith the Lord. Shalom. Shalom.